Theological Seminary. Um, my name is Father Mike Connors. I'm the director of the John S. Martin Program in Homiletics. And uh, this event is sponsored by the Martin Program. I'm very happy that you're with us this evening. We have uh, <coughs> seminarians, we have lay MDiv students, we have um, some clergy from the uh, Diocese of Fort Wayne, South Bend, and some from Kalamazoo. Glad that you're able to be with us tonight. Uh, when we made this plan um, for the unair conditioned auditorium <laughs> for September 9th, I didn't think it would be an issue. <laughs> the inverted logic of 2013, September is hotter than July. So. <laughs> Obviously, we moved into this space, which uh, I think is a bit more comfortable. Uh, thank you to Father Pete Jarrett, the Superior of Morrow Seminary, and the guys of Morrow Seminary, <laughs> Dr. Mullahan. <laughs> Thank you all for your hospitality and hosting us here tonight. Um, since the Martin Program is sponsoring this event, I get to make a small commercial announcement. Uh, the Martin Program, as some of you know, is sponsoring another major conference on preaching next summer, June of uh, 2014, June 25th, 26th, 27th. Preaching and the new evangelization. <coughs> I hope that many of you will be able to attend some or all of that conference. You'll find more information on the Martin Program website, which is martinprogram.md.edu. I also have some uh, handouts, which I'll put on the table in the back, which gives the tentative schedule for that. Our keynote speakers include Father Timothy Radcliffe, Sister Jamie Phelps, Father Virgilio Elizondo, Father Greg Hiley, Dominican, and last and not least, Cardinal Donald Worrell. So I hope that many of you will consider joining us for that next year. Father Don Sr. will be back as well for that uh, event as a workshop presented. Um, I'm sorry that no members of the Martin family could be with us tonight, but I want to acknowledge, as always, their tremendous generosity to us, their commitment to uh, improving and Catholic preaching. So even though they are not here, I know I speak for all of you, thanking them for their uh, support of this and, and many other events. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Father, uh, excuse me, Dr. Matt Ashley, the Chair of the Theology Department, who will introduce our speaker today. <coughs>
months ago, the president of a very large, uh, complex, uh, diverse theological school in, in Chicago, the uh, Chicago Theological Union. He's been president of several professional organizations, including the Association of Theological Schools of the United States and Canada, and also the Catholic Biblical Association, and also serving on the Pontifical Biblical Commission, to which he has been appointed three times, once by John Paul II, and twice by Benedict XVI. So Francis better get on the stage. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot. Um, but in, he may be best known uh, to many Catholics and to many students, who many of us teach in our Foundations of Theology course, as the chief editor of the first edition of the Catholic Study Bible, which appeared in 1990, and which was followed by a second edition, which came out just a few years ago, co-edited by Don and by John Collins. In addition to this work, he has authored um, something like a dozen books. Um, I was counting on my computer screen, trying to figure out which translations I should count and which not. Um, on a number of topics, but with a particular focus on the Synoptic Gospels, with a commentary on Matthew in the Abingdon New Testament commentary series, as well as a commentary on 1 Peter, Jude, and 2 Peter in the well-known Sacrapagina Biblical commentary series. He's published numerous articles in journals, such as the Catholic Biblical Quarterly, Currents in Theology and Mission, Journal of Religion, Interpretation, Word and World, Missiology, and Worship. With this kind of experience and success in the worlds of academic administration, biblical scholarship, along with a lively sense for the profound pastoral dimensions of academic work, it is indeed a pleasure for me to welcome Father Senior to the distinguished list of past lecturers sponsored by the Martin Program in Homiletics and Liturgies, a list to which he now <coughs> adds additional lessons. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming him as he speaks to us this evening on Preaching the Mystery of Faith. Thanks, Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Matt. And, uh, I know that you're facing a visitation from the Association of Theological Schools. Uh, given that nice introduction, I'll put in a word for, <laughs> for you. <laughs> but it really is a, a great pleasure and an honor to be with you. And now that we're in the chapel, it may add a certain somberness or sacredness to what we're doing, but uh, it, it's a pleasure to be with you in any case. And it's also a, a joy for me, really, to reflect with you on this recent statement of the uh, United States bishops uh, preaching the mystery of faith, which uh, just was officially published in January and was approved at their last uh, November meeting. As many of you know, it, it follows upon a previous statement on preaching that was issued uh, by the Bishop's Committee on Priestly Life and Ministry 30 years ago, which was entitled Fulfilled in Your Hearing. And it was a text that served the church very well in many courses on uh, Catholic preaching, uh, used it as a, a text. Uh, but the bishops, uh, in reflecting on the challenging task and responsibility of preaching, uh, as any of us would, said in the past 30 years, a lot has happened. And uh, given the importance of the preaching ministry, uh, it was uh, time perhaps to reflect on this again as a church in the United States. And one of the, the things, I think each of you have a handout or an outline. By the way, can you hear me okay in the, in the back? Sorry, I can't hear you, so... It's okay? A little louder or what? Okay. Uh, wave a hand if I drop my voice in the course of things. But you should have a handout, and uh, the handout is sort of a sketch uh, of the overall document. And it, it names some of the issues 
that the bishops thought uh, really impinge upon the, the ministry of preaching. Uh, the increased cultural diversity in our country in the past 30 years certainly accelerating. The impact of our culture, the, the dimensions of it that are increased secularization or a focus on the individual. Uh, we hear this all the time. But a disaffection with the church. Uh, the bishops forthrightly say they, the hemorrhaging of people from uh, the church, particularly young adults, and the connection or the complication of this with the loss of moral authority due to the sexual abuse crisis. And also the, the need that many people sense that our congregations that come together uh, many times do not have the kind of fundamental uh, understanding of the church's faith, almost a catechetical need that of course is prompting the focus on the new evangelization. So it was these uh, kind of, of concerns uh, that led uh, the bishops over a period of a couple of years uh, to try to put together uh, a text that would give some uh, guidelines, some help to those in the preaching ministry. The focus of this text is on the Sunday homily and uh, but also in the text, the bishops acknowledge that the preaching ministry is much broader than that. And so tonight, as I uh, want to reflect on this, I'm keeping in mind the diversity of ministries that all of you do represent and will represent. So while the focus is on the homily, uh, the wider focus is on our, our ministry of proclamation of the word that can take many different forms. There's two things that I would like to focus on out of the various uh, subjects covered in this preaching the mystery of faith. And the first is to, to reflect on the dynamic, the dynamic and powerful uh, theology of the word that I think has coalesced since Vatican II on up to the present moment, and I would include this text as part of it. And, and just to recall that briefly, but also uh, to, to sort of savor the, the power and beauty of the biblical word. I think that really for preaching, we need almost a culture of the biblical word that we are part of and that we imbibe and that touches not only the content of our preaching, but the spirit of it. Uh, that it sort of gets deep within our bones and affects our spirituality. So it's those two aspects, a sort of a theology of the word, reflecting on the biblical text itself, and if you will, a kind of implications for a spirituality of those who proclaim the word. Uh, starting first with this notion of a consistent theology of the word, I think one of the remarkable features of the post-Vatican II church regarding our reflection on the word of God is the strong and consistent mode of reflection on what is the ultimate foundation for the church's mission to proclaim the word of God. One can in fact draw a straight line from Vatican II's dogmatic constitution on sacred revelation, divine revelation, de verbum, formulated near the very end of the council in 1965, through the Catechism of the Catholic Church that was published in 1992 in its reflection on the creed, which in fact draws heavily on the council text de verbum, and on to Pope Benedict's post-synodal exhortation of 2010, verbum domini, which as you know was a reaction or reflection on the Synod of 2008 on the scriptures in the life and the ministry of the church. I'm sure that many of you have read and reflected on that. If you haven't had a chance, I find Verbum Domini to be a very, very rich uh, reflection, uh, both theological and pastoral. And then finally, to the bishop's statement itself, uh, preaching the ministry of the word, they, they draw on this uh, sort of growing and consistent reflection. And there's a common pattern 
when you look at these documents and, and try to understand them, uh, the formulation found in, in De Verbum, Vatican II's uh, proclamation, is seminal. You may recall that this document underwent a, a rather complex and even controversial process before it was finally approved by the Council Fathers. The original schema proposed at the opening session of the Council was rejected as being too scholastic, too abstract, too rigid in this formulation. Then a paritus for the German bishops at the Council, Joseph Ratzinger said that the schema was, quote, cramped, end quote, and, quote, essentially a canonization of Roman school theology, end quote. Now, Pope John XXIII sought a solution to the sharp divisions among the Council Fathers by appointing a commission to work on the text, a commission co-chaired by Cardinal Ottaviani on the one side and Cardinal Bea. And if you know anything about these characters, they represented polar opposite viewpoints about the document. It sounds like a Chicago City Council commission. <laughs> Ultimately, the document, benefiting from the educational and formative process of the Council's intervening sessions, it came back several times uh, for reflection. When it was finally submitted at the very end of the Council, it was approved by a near unanimous vote. And I think that going through that process really matured the De Verbum and, and made it a much stronger uh, ecclesial text. And, and here are some of the, the key points, uh, uh, just to recall them for you, because I think that the theology that emerges from it, the theology of Revelation, is very rich. It says, first and foremost, the God revealed in the Bible is a God who self-communicates, a God who is not self-contained, but who wishes to reveal himself to the world. And this is evident in the account of creation that begins the biblical saga in Genesis chapter one. Through his all-powerful word, God creates the universe in all of its dimensions and in all of its beauty. Above all, God creates the human being, male and female, as the summit of creation and establishes a relationship with humans. Secondly, the Bible, the council affirms, portrays the human person, male and female, as made in the divine image, therefore as capable, indeed, destined to respond to God. A short time ago, I was in Israel and uh, working with Catholic Relief Service there, and we went to visit Hebron. And I don't know if many of you have had the chance to be in Hebron. It's, it's terrible what's going on in Hebron, the, the drawing of lines there. And uh, we were introduced and, and escorted around Hebron by two young Israelis that belong to an organization that is called In His Image. It's a secular organization, but they are a human watch rights group, and they've chosen that image out of Jewish tradition, that the human being, every human being is made in the divine image. It's an extraordinary uh, biblical motif. And therefore, as made in the divine image, the human person has the capacity, indeed the destiny, to respond to God. Thus, revelation, as affirmed in this emerging tradition here, is not an abstract notion about the transmission of truth, but at its root is a relationship between God and the world he created. This relational nature of revelation is fundamental to the whole theology of the word developed in Dei Verbum and continuing to the present day. And thirdly, the God who creates the universe and the human being does not stay aloof from his creation, but is involved, although mysteriously, in human history. These are very fundamental convictions, I think, for us as a faith community. The long and tortured saga of Israel presented in subsequent biblical history reflects this conviction. God is present, protecting Israel, admonishing it, forgiving it, carrying it forward, often in spite of itself. And although the main focus of the Bible is on God's unique people, Israel, 
it is also clear from the testimony of the scriptures, the council asserts, that the God of Israel is also the God of the nations. And the entire history of all peoples and of the universe itself is God's own arena. Fourth, almost to the end of the list, the culmination of human history and of the really revealing word of God, the culmination comes in the person of Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, the definitive revealer of God's word to the world. And here at Dei Verbal in the council document, and followed by each of the subsequent documents I have cited, turn to the prologue of John's Gospel, the most eloquent biblical expression of this conviction. Uh, Pope Benedict in Verbum Domini takes two key texts, creation and John's prologue, and sort of says that, you know, encompasses the theology of the word for us as Christians. The word who is with God from the beginning is the word spoken by God and perfectly expressing God's being so that the word is God. This is the word that arcs down into the created world and becomes flesh. In the flesh of Jesus Christ, John asserts, the community sees the glory of God. Other key texts cited in our documents that also express this conviction are found, for example, in the opening words of the epistle to the Hebrews. You know it well. In times past, God spoke in partial and various ways to our ancestors through the prophets. In these last days, he spoke to us through a son whom he made heir of all things and through whom he created the universe, who is the refulgence of his glory, the very imprint of his being, and who sustains all things by his mighty word. Or we remember the opening lines of the letter to the Ephesians, also cited by De Verbum. In all wisdom and insight, God has made known to us the mystery of his will in accord with his favor that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to sum up all things in Christ in heaven and on earth. And finally, the word embodied and made flesh in Jesus Christ, the final sort of step in this evolving foundation for the proclamation of the word. The word embodied in Jesus, a word expressed in his teaching and compassionate healing, in his gathering of a community, in his giving of his life in the fullness of love, in his conquering of death, and his return to communion with the Father for all time, this full articulation of God's word of redeeming love for the world is now entrusted to the apostles and their successors, entrusted to the Christian community. Fired by the Spirit of God sent upon the church by the risen and triumphant Christ, the apostolic church is commissioned to proclaim the word of God to the world and in the spirit of that word to form communities of life gathered in the name of Jesus and destined to be witnesses of God's redeeming love for the world. Here in this progression, this arc of the word of God into the midst of human history and human experience, this is really the ultimate source and authority and inspiration for the preaching ministry of the church. This is the sequence from the first impulse of creation through the incarnation and on to the apostolic mission of the church that is first articulated in Dei Verbum, succinctly repeated in the Catechism, beautifully expanded upon in Pope Benedict's eloquent Verbum Domini, which taking its cue from the General Synod, reflects on the scriptures. And it's the same doctrinal or biblical basis for the church's call to proclaim the word that is try to be captured in this text. We should not be content, however, it seems to me, to articulate even schematically as we've tried to do uh, the biblical foundation for the ministry of preaching in, in any kind of abstract terms. When we actually reflect on the word of God as presented in the scriptures themselves, we are taken deeply into the pulsating beauty 
and power of our biblical heritage and deep into the underlying meaning of our ministry of preachers within the church. And I think this is so compelling for us to be immersed in the passion and the beauty uh, of the word. And with your patience for a few moments of text that you are so familiar with, allow me to just look through the biblical lens for a moment at the church's mission to proclaim the word of God in the midst of these unusual times. We think of this very moment where we are here. Uh, this incredible tipping point, it seems to me, in the midst of the threat of violence that's all around us. The word of God, <coughs> verbum domini, the word of God, verbum dei, Few phrases resonate more powerfully within the biblical saga itself than that phrase. The motif of God's word twists through the entire story of Israel like a powerful sinew. From the creating word of the opening chapters of Genesis to the healing word of the lamb who was slain in the book of Revelation, the Bible is convinced of the overwhelming and transformative power of God's word. At the dawn of the universe, God's word hovers over the tohu vabohu, the formless and chaotic void, and through a word transforms it into light and order and beauty and warmth, the light of the sun by day, the glow of the stars and the moon by night, the fertile earth, the marvel of the human person, male and female. Astoundingly, the Bible affirms that the human being, male and female, is made in the image and likeness of God. So powerful is the word that it becomes a self-reflection. We are shaped and formed in the deepest level of our being to be like God, to bear the divine imprint, indeed to live the divine life, a strong and consistent tradition of Christian spirituality from the beginning. This word of God that shaped the universe and shapes the human heart pushes out into history, forging a people and giving them a destiny. God's word has a particularly transformative impact on the leaders and teachers of God's people, ultimately laying the groundwork for the church's mission of preaching. God's word anoints the kings and emboldens the prophets. Moses, who would lead God's people out of slavery and despair, encountering God in the burning bush at Horeb at the mountain of God, hesitant, stammering, fearful, as God anoints him to lead the people out of slavery. Oh, my Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past or even now that you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Then the Lord God said to him, Who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. Or we remember the call of the prophet Amos of Tekoa, dragooned by God into a powerful mission of justice reluctantly. I am no prophet, he says, nor a prophet's son. I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. And so he went. Or Jeremiah, tongue-tied also, hesitant. I am only a boy, he tells God. God replies, do not say I am only a boy. For you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Or consider Isaiah himself, standing in the portals of the temple, overwhelmed by a sense of God's presence and his own unworthiness, crying out, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. The seraph purifies his troubled heart and his lips with a burning coal from the temple brazier. 
And then the voice of God penetrates the prophet's dread. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? His anguish put aside, the prophet speaks. Here I am, Lord. Send me. And so it would be with all of the great characters who form the biblical saga. Men and women, unlikely vessels of God, hesitant and awkward, yet summoned by God's compelling and all-powerful word to take up their mission on behalf of the people, leading them out of Egypt and slavery, sustaining them in their desert trek, bringing them into the land of promise, purifying them in their failure, comforting them in exile, bringing them back home. The word of God, God's call, is often disruptive in the biblical text. Breaking into ordinary lives and asking ordinary people to bear a mission of human transformation and to experience profound and sometimes wrenching change in order to be faithful to that divine summons. Few passages can match the fierce poetry of Psalm 29 as it hymns this power of the divine word. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over vast waters. The voice of the Lord is mighty. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The voice of the Lord strikes fiery flames. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips forests. And in his temple all say glory. Or listen to the vivid imagery of the Book of Wisdom in speaking of God's punishment of Pharaoh. For when peaceful stillness compassed everything, and the night in its swift course was half spent, your all-powerful word from heaven's royal throne bounded a fierce warrior into the doomed land, bearing the sharp sword of your inexorable decree. And as it alighted, it filled every place with death. He still reached to heaven while he stood upon the earth. Such vivid, powerful imagery filled with emotion. Or in a different mode, a text, what text could be more beautiful than the one of Isaiah 55 quoted in De Verbum? For just as from the heavens the rain and the snow come down and do not return there till they have watered the earth, making it fruitful and fertile, giving seed to him who sows and bread to him who eats, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but shall do my will, achieving the end for which I sent it. Many people think that whole structure informs of John's prologue and indeed his whole gospel. The word of God, dynamic, powerful, awesome, filled with startling creativity and beauty, this is the sense that Israel had of God's imminent presence in the midst of history. This is the pattern of God's self-disclosure and generous abundance that paves the way for Christian reflection on the mystery of Jesus as God's word incarnate, and indeed as ultimately a revelation of the mystery of the Trinity itself. So deep and penetrating is this biblical metaphor of the word as a way of speaking of God's redemptive presence in the world, that in the New Testament, the notion of God's word becomes synonymous with Christ and with the Christian message. Of course, John makes this point so eloquently in the prologue to his gospel that we know so well. God speaking at the dawn before time, that word so perfectly articulated that it indeed reveals God fully. It is theos. 
that word bounding into creation, into the world of civilization, and unfathomably, beautifully, that word becoming flesh, true flesh, truly human. And through the human embodiment of the word, through Jesus, the incarnate word, the glory of God is now revealed to us and we can see it. Thus, every gesture of Jesus, every act of compassion, every word he speaks, and even and especially his ultimate giving of his life for those whom he loves as friends, reveals the God who speaks as one who will not condemn the world, but his intent that the world might live through him. It's the core logic of John's theology. This same fundamental conviction that Jesus is the embodied word of God also colors the early Christian language used to describe its own mission, a mission that continued Christ's living presence in the world. The early chapters of Acts make this point in a vivid way, as you recall. Disciples, broken and despairing, are transformed by their encounter with the living word of the risen Christ. Paul, excuse me, Peter and the twelve break out of their room of fear and preach the word to the crowds of Jewish pilgrims who come to Jerusalem for the Pentecost festival. Neither threat nor imprisonment nor flogging can stop these apostles and witnesses to the word. Or we can think of the appearance of the two disciples fleeing Jerusalem in despair and sadness, their hopes broken by the death of Jesus. The text cited at length in the bishop's statement, by the way, on preaching and its intrinsic link to the Eucharist. The mysterious pilgrim who joins them breaks open the power of God's word, breaks bread with them, and their hearts burn within them, and they return to the community in Jerusalem. Or we think of Paul encountering the risen Christ, his world turned upside down in the dramatic conversion scene accounted in the road to Damascus in the Acts of the Apostles. In his letter to the Galatians, the same Paul in later times and after much reflection and experience would think of his encounter with the word not as a dramatic singular event, but as a mysterious call that reached him as he says, before he was even knit together in his mother's womb, a destiny that God had in store for him for all eternity. In this beautiful reflection in Galatians, Paul recapitulates the experience of Isaiah and Jeremiah before him, prophets who realized that the creative power of God's word had chosen them and shaped them from the very beginning, even before they saw the light of day. And so we have Paul and the men and women who ranged through the Mediterranean world. Paul and Silas and Barnabas, Timothy, Lydia, Aquila, Priscilla, Phoebe, the deacon of Cancrea, Apollos of Alexandria, inflamed with the Christian message, describing their work as the proclamation of the word, as the announcement of good news, as a compulsion to speak the word of God. Yes, we think of Paul the apostle, that passionate, driven character that he was. You can sense his bold pastoral plan in Romans 15 and in other passages in his letters. He intended to move around the rim of the Mediterranean world through the power of God's word, planting Christian communities in places no one else had ever been, thereby making Israel jealous and finally, triumphantly, handing over the entire world to Christ, who would then give it to God. Paul thought this would take six months to a year. <laughs> really, I mean, he thought this is very doable. Let's get going. For the sake of this mission, Paul thinks of himself as compelled to proclaim the word of God, the word that is Christ. And who can forget his inexorable logic in the 10th chapter of Romans. For there is no distinction, Paul says, between Jew and Greek, the same Lord is Lord of all, enriching all who call upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him in whom they have not yet believed? 
And how can they believe in him of whom they have not yet heard? And how can they hear without someone to preach? And how can people preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Thus, faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. One of the special features of this text, preaching the word, is, as I mentioned, as you may be aware, it considers what are the spiritual implications, if you like, of such a theology of the word for one who is called to proclaim that biblical word within the preaching mission of the church. And this is a valuable and, and new dimension of the bishop's statement compared to their previous one. Uh, I will not repeat uh, all of that section. I've summarized some of it on the, the uh, text you have, the outline, and you can read it for yourself. But allow me just to offer some personal reflections on some of the aspects that are touched upon in the statement of what the beauty and power of the scriptures might require of us who are called in different ways to proclaim God's word. The bishop's statement, as I mentioned, focuses on those who preach the Sunday homily, but they also acknowledge in the statement that proclaiming the word can take many forms. And so a, a kind of spirituality, the word can touch all of us, no matter what our role is or will be. First of all, I believe that those who are commissioned to preach from the scriptures, that we should try to absorb the rhetorical power and the beauty of the biblical language. Rhetorical, I use it here not in the narrow and sometimes pejorative sense that we hear it used when we say, well, that's just rhetoric or that's political rhetoric. But I mean rhetorical in the classical sense meaning language and forms of discourse capable of moving the human spirit and the human heart. This is the sense of rhetoric in which most of the New Testament authors themselves would have been schooled. Most of the biblical literature understands the importance of rich symbols, of language that has power and beauty, of imagery that rises from experience, that captures the imagination and touches the heart. Jeremiah, for example, envisioning his prophetic vocation to steadfastness as God's fashioning him into a pillar of iron and a wall of brass. <laughs> well, God's own elusiveness, Jeremiah says, is like a treacherous brook that does not abide. Isaiah, daring to have God shower contempt on those who trample the courts of their temple, their hands scarlet with guilt. The composer of the Lament Psalms, who is able to shake a verbal fist at God's absence, demanding to know where God is in the starkness of a night of suffering and isolation, a prayer repeated by Jesus. The pointed parable of a Nathan about the ewe lamb that stabs to the heart of David's guilt or the parables of Jesus, where in Luke's gospel, as he challenges the lack of compassion on the part of the religious leaders in three extraordinary mercy parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, or the expansive and indelible Pauline word portrait of charity in 1 Corinthians 13. Saturday, I had a wedding in Chicago, and the couple had chosen that passage, and when you, you know, reflect on in a setting like that, my God, Paul's ability to do this word portrait of what love means. Or the author of the second letter of Peter asking the community to wait expectantly until the morning star rises in your heart. Or the near mad symbolism of Revelation's heavenly vision that still fires the imagination of the artist, the prophet, and the mystic. Everyone in education today, theological and other disciplines, 
is aware that despite or because of our prowess in empirical and technological matters, we might be in danger of creating a generation whose language is impoverished. With little exposure to classical literature on the part of many, or, or the best of the modern for that matter, with only a glancing acquaintance with the Bible itself, even in some theology schools, and being force-fed from an early age with the dull technocratic or even worse, sometimes insipid personalistic language of contemporary society. The student preacher of today can enter the arena with one hand tied behind their back. Ken Burns' public television series on the American Civil War that first appeared a few years ago and is frequently rebroadcast, re which apparently more people have seen this series than any other broadcast in human history. The power of that series derived in part, if you saw it and remember it, from the poignancy and epic scope of its subject matter, surely, and from the evocative photos of those who participated in that American tragedy. But it also used, if you remember, to an extraordinary degree, the power of language. As viewers listened to love letters, pages from diaries, snatches of speeches by orators such as Abraham Lincoln or Frederick Douglass, they were moved by the rhetorical power of language, much of it, by the way, drawn from the Bible. I fear the few letters from home today and in the age of the phone and email and texting, not many of us are writing letters, would have similar force. Not because people do not have feelings or noble sentiments, but because for many people, even educated ones, the language required to express their deepest convictions, especially ones that come from deep within their soul, can fail them. If I had anything to do with training preachers, I would urge them to spend more time on massive doses of reading and literature, especially poetry. I know it's easy to say. Especially, of course, spending time in a reflective and prayerful reading of the Bible itself. The privilege of preaching from the biblical lectionary compels us, I believe, to develop a culture or better a habit of the heart of biblical reading. It's as simple as this. A personal familiarity with the terrain of the biblical literature and the biblical history, a passionate love of the biblical text that belongs to us, and the ready access to it that comes from only thoughtful, habitual, prolonged, thorough, and deeply prayerful reading and rereading of the biblical literature itself. Some of you may be familiar with the name of my a fellow religious, Father Carol Stumiller. <clears throat> he taught at Notre Dame and the Summer Institute in different ways for many years. He was a great biblical scholar. I'm very grateful to say a personal mentor for me. He published a series of books entitled Biblical Meditations. There, there's seven different volumes of them for the liturgical year. They're still in print. We still get his royalties uh, coming in. <laughs> And I have a vivid memory, this is absolutely true, of finding Carol in our chapel early each morning, reading the scriptures, with his Bible on one hand, his notebook, you know, moving from his meditation on the text to the proclamation of the word. Those meditations came right out of his, his prayer and his reflection. Secondly, Preaching with a biblical character, I think, should be experientially grounded, but not excessively autobiographical and not centered on the preacher. The statement, preaching the mystery of faith, makes its point, and it's a good one. Pope Benedict himself in Verbum Domini observed, quote, the homily is a means of bringing the scriptural message to life in a way that helps the faithful to realize that God's word is present and at work in their everyday lives. Consequently, those who have been charged with preaching by virtue of a specific ministry ought to take this task to heart. Generic and abstract homilies, which obscure the directness of God's word, should be avoided, as well as useless digressions, which risk drawing greater attention to the preacher 
than to the heart of the gospel message. I might add that this past spring, I had the privilege uh, as part of the biblical commission of uh, living in the same place where Pope Francis is camped out in Stoma Sancta Marta, much to the consternation of the people surrounding him. And uh, we were able to be part of his mass every morning. And his own style of preaching is so unaffected. Homily is probably not more than three minutes, no text. From the heart, personal and thoroughly biblical. He really has a biblical imagination, but never drawing attention to himself. The Bible also makes this point. The Bible is a book of the people. It is folk literature, not high literature by and large. The sagas of Genesis and Exodus, the practical legislation of Leviticus, the chronicles of the monarchy, the war stories of the Maccabees, the oracles of the prophets, the aphorisms of Proverbs, the healing stories and parables of the Gospels, the sometimes blunt, sometimes poetic letters of Paul were written by people who lived and felt what they spoke about. The biblical scribe trained for the kingdom drew indeed, as Matthew's gospel puts it, from their treasure house. And this is what gives the biblical materials their credibility, handed on from generation to generation, turned over lovingly in the heart and soul of believers, earnestly prayed and pondered over, quoted by heart. The biblical materials reflect the faith experience of those who shape these texts. The scriptures, therefore, have an inherent capacity to touch the faith of the one who reads it. The great teachers and pastors of the Bible had an eye for human experience, an appreciation for the real dimensions of the human character. Analysis of the speech patterns of the sayings and discourses and parables of Jesus reveal his strong experiential base. As one New Testament scholar said, listening to the parables of Jesus is like watching a home movie in which transcendent truth takes on vivid human terms. His parables reveal someone who, as storytellers must, had a penetrating eye and a compassionate eye for the human drama, with all of its nobility, its crudeness, its suffering, its comedy. For example, the characters that fill the gospel parables are not usually ideal types. Along with the noble father who patiently awaits his errant son and the shepherd who risks everything for one sheep and the charitable Samaritan who cares for his natural enemy, there is also the crafty steward who feathers his own nest as he faces the prospect of unemployment, the pompous Pharisee singing his own praises while the tax collector dares not even lift up his eyes and beats his breast in remorse the man who answers his door for his supposed friend, only, able to be, only to be able to sleep without interruption, the judge who gives the widow her due only to get rid of her, and the son who squanders his inheritance and ends up tending the pigs, and his elder brother who resents the too lavish forgiveness of their parent who welcomes the prodigal home. You know, the list of characters can go on. Jesus was not approved. <laughs> he, he savored this. You know the rogue, the appreciative eye for human comedy and human tragedy that characterizes the parables reflects the earth-rooted character of the Bible as a whole. It is usually not polite, elegant literature. It has the power of genuine human experience of life itself. And yet, the author of almost every book of the Bible is anonymous. The focus is not on the storyteller or on the author. Like the artisans of the cathedrals, the biblical authors did not sign their names and often drew attention even to someone else as the source of their authority, pseudepigrapha. Paul might be an exception, but after all, it's hard to write a letter and not have some personal referent. But even Paul, with his robust, extroverted nature, used autobiography sparingly, and usually in those cases where his apostolic authority was under attack. And most of the letters of Paul were not even written by himself alone, but as he frequently states in his opening lines, were collaborative affairs composed with co-workers. The intensely interpersonal focus of, 
of our culture. It can make the self-transcendence of the preacher a difficult challenge. Managing to be personal without riveting attention on oneself is an art and a spiritual discipline not easily learned. Nevertheless, there is a way in which those who proclaim the word can expose their personal convictions and experience without forcing the biblical message to be trimmed to their own dimensions and their own concerns. Preaching in this sense, I think, is like presiding at liturgy. It's a public communal act and the scope of the preacher, like the style of the presider, must reach beyond the confines of one's own experience to make way for the varying dimensions of those who hear the word through the proclamation of the preacher. Finally, if you bear with me, I know the seats, this is one of the, these seats are not as soft as the ones in the auditorium, but yeah. Don't blame me. <laughs> Finally, preaching with a biblical character should be expansive, evocative, visionary, rather than didactic, moralistic, or trivial. Preaching is, in fact, an expression of the essential missionary character of the church. Let me just, for a moment, just a brief moment, reflect on this. If the homily or our preaching is to match the scope and character of the biblical text itself and harmonize with the deep seriousness of the liturgy, then it should truly inspire and enlarge the human heart of the one who hears it. This is the spirit, isn't it, of the church's mission to the world, the call to proclaim the word of God, which is a word not of condemnation, but a word of life a word embodied and most vividly proclaimed in the person and mission of Jesus, who it's its taproot, the wellspring of all Christian ministry, of all sense of mission. Mission is not simply understood as mission agentes to those who have not yet heard the gospel, which remains a responsibility of those who hold the gospel to their heart. But mission in the sense of the new evangelist to all of us, where embers may have grown cool, or the example of the church itself may have caused offense and scandal to inflame the human heart of faith again. One of the texts that has always struck me, I have a story with it that I'm gonna trim, uh, is is from Matthew's uh, gospel in chapter 13, the parable of uh, the weeds and the wheat. And uh, Jesus gives this parable, and later the disciples approach him and say, uh, explain to us the parable. And he starts by saying, the field is the world. Hode agros esten ho cosmos. I thought of that. He, he didn't say the field is the church or the field is Israel. The field is the world. To turn towards that world and to give it the seed of life is the call of the gospel. Remember the most famous quote from the council? I was glad to see that Pope Francis quoted this several times. He's quoted it already. You know it. The joys and hopes, the grief and anguish of the people of our time, especially of those who are poor or afflicted in any way, are the joy and hope, the grief and anguish of the followers of Christ. Nothing that is genuinely human fails to find an echo in their hearts. For theirs is a community composed of human beings, human beings who united in Christ and guided by the Holy Spirit press onwards towards the kingdom of the Father and are bearers of a message of salvation intended for all peoples. That is why Christians cherish a feeling of deep solidarity with the human race and its history. And this interplay between the scriptures and the culture and events that surrounded Israel, surrounded the New Testament church, is like a ebb and flow 
the language of Israel, its sense of architecture, its sense of liturgy, its structure of the temple, it was all drawn from Canaanite culture. The impact of the events of the destruction of Jerusalem, the Roman Imperium, of the Greek Koine, all of this churning and opening up the horizon of the early community. This is so powerful. Pope John Paul II, who is quoted in here, spoke of this, the one who preaches must be a person of communion. Communion with our fellow human beings and communion with our earth and with our world. I've been struck over the past few months, as perhaps you have, by the frequent comments of Pope Francis along these lines. For the church's face to the world to be only negative and corrective, rather than radiating a sense of tenderness and care for our world, for the church to be absorbed only with its own life and concerns, and not turn to the world is, as the Pope put it, to risk choking on our own stale air famous phrase. And he repeatedly uses images of the church as mother, as nourishing, as tender and loving, as merciful, as reaching out to those most vulnerable. And you know, it's in the encounter of the proclamation of the word and those who receive it and hear it that I think the face of the church is most vividly presented, for better or for worse. The bishop's statement concludes, and I will conclude, with words of encouragement. As priests and lay ministers and people close to the church are well aware of our problems, the corrosive and demoralizing effect of the sexual abuse crisis continues to be a burden, a sense of diminishment, the sometimes shrinking numbers and shrinking financial resources inflict on us, the polarities and struggles of our society that have an impact on us, it's sort of like a low-grade depression. The list can go on, and, and some of these things we cannot control, even as we struggle to live lives of integrity. Yet some things we can control. We can give new life to our preaching. We can work harder at our preparation. We can strive in our prayer and study to sink more deeply into the beauty and power of our scriptures. We can impress on ourselves, and if we are teachers of theology or pastoral ministry, we can try to impress on our students that the ministry of preaching is going to be the most important encounter that many of them will have with their people. And for our people, that the encounter with the homily or the proclamation is probably their most important encounter with the living word of God and with the face of Christ's church. The bishops conclude their statement on preaching with a dedication to Mary. They cite a beautiful image used by Ephraim and Augustine that Mary first conceived the word in her heart before she conceived the word in her womb. And we too, like Mary, the mother of Jesus, the first proclaimer of the word incarnate, can strive to bear Christ in our heart and in our words for the sake of the world. Thank you for your attention.